Good afternoon to all of you, and uh, welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on our agenda today. Our CPSC staff will brief the commission on the proposed rule, safety standard addressing blade contact injuries on table saws. The CPS staff members briefing us today are Ms. Caroline Paul, mechanical engineer from the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction, Dr. Joel Reck, Assistant Deputy Director for Engineering Sciences, and Ms. Hyun Kim from the Office of General Counsel. I want to th sincerely thank all of you for being here today. And these three uh, people and staff represent a whole team of people who have worked on this issue. And so we want to thank all of them for being here as well. At the conclusion of today's briefing, our staff will turn, uh, excuse me, we will turn over the hearing to the commissioners to ask the questions. We have uh, agreed to do three rounds of 10 minute questions per commissioner. And then at that point we'll assess because if the commissioners have additional questions then we will consider extending the, the briefing. So with that, we're now gonna start the staff briefing. Thank you again for being here and uh, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Hyun Kim. I'm in the Office of the General Counsel. I'm here today with Caroline Paul and Joel Recht from Engineering Sciences. We'll be discussing the notice of proposed rulemaking to address blade contact injuries on table saws. I'll be giving a brief overview of our statutory framework for issuing a standard under the CPSA. Joel will discuss the staff briefing package and basis for the preliminary findings in the proposed rule. Section 7 and Section 9 of the CPSA establish the requirements for the Commission to issue a consumer product safety standard. Section 7 authorizes the Commission to issue consumer product safety requirements for a consumer product or to set forth requirements that a product be marked or accompanied by clear or adequate warnings or instructions. Any requirements must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. Section 9 of the CPSA specifies the procedure that the Commission must follow and findings that the Commission must make to issue a consumer product safety standard under Section 7. The Commission has the option of beginning a rulemaking with a notice of proposed rule or an advance notice of proposed rule. For table saws, the Commission began with an advance notice of proposed rule, which was published on October 11, 2011. The Commission received more than 1,600 comments. Several hundred commenters supported the rule. Other commenters who opposed the rule raised a number of issues. The primary issues included whether a proposed standard would mandate a monopoly, whether the standard would limit consumer choice in selecting table saws, whether the government should require individuals to use safer table saws, and questions were also raised about the efficacy of the voluntary standard and the use of the modular blade guard. Joel will address these issues further in his presentation. Under Section 9 of the CPSA, before the Commission can issue a consumer product safety standard, the Commission must publish in the Federal Register the text of the proposed rule. The proposed rule must identify the product and risk of injury. It must describe regulatory alternatives that the Commission considered it must conduct a preliminary regulatory analysis. It should invite and review comments. The Commission must also provide an opportunity for the oral presentation of data, views, or arguments, in addition to written comments, when the Commission develops a consumer product safety standard. Prior to issuing a standard, the Commission has to consider and make appropriate findings to be included in the rule. These findings include the degree and nature of risk intended to be addressed by the rule, the approximate number of products subject to the rule, the need for the public and the effect of the rule on the utility, cost, and availability of the product, and any other means of achieving the objective of the rule while minimizing adverse effects on competition. There are additional findings. These include whether a rule is reasonably necessary to reduce an unreasonable risk of injury, whether the rule is in the public interest, whether the expected benefits of the rule bear a reasonable relationship to the costs, 
and whether the rule imposes the least burdensome requirement that prevents or adequately reduces the injury. In addition, if a voluntary standard addressing the risk of injury has been adopted and implemented, the Commission must find either that the voluntary standard is not likely to eliminate or adequately reduce the risk of injury, or that substantial compliance with the voluntary standard is unlikely. Joel will now give you an overview of the briefing package and the basis for the preliminary findings in the proposed rule. Thank you, Hayan. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Burkle and Commissioners. Uh, Caroline Paul is our staff expert and the project manager for table saws. However, uh, Caroline has just returned from an extended trip overseas um, and is still adjusting to our time zone. So I will be presenting this on her behalf. Um, I'm going to discuss the product description, the incident data and hazard patterns, recommendations to mitigate the hazards, regulatory analysis, adequacy of the voluntary standards, findings, and the staff recommendation. So what is a table saw? Uh, we have a few of them in front of you uh, to d uh, show. Uh, but a table saw is a common power tool used in many wood shops. Its purpose is to make straight, accurate cuts in wood and other materials. There are three major types of, ben of table saws, and these include bench saws, uh, all of the ones in front of you are bench saws, contractor saws, and cabinet saws. Bench saws retail for about $130 to $1,500 each. They can be placed on a bench or a wheeled cart, um, and they are portable, including these heavier job site saws uh, to the commission's left. Um, contractor saws are heavier and more accurate and less easily transportable, and retail from about $500 to $2,000. And cabinet saws are the heaviest, most accurate, highest end uh, table saws that consumers generally use. And they retail from about $1,200 to $5,000. Some of the important parts of a table saw include a miter gauge and rip fence that are used to help guide the workpiece. Uh, also, there are important safety devices, including the blade guard, splitter or spreader, and anti-kickback device. And I'll talk about these more. Um, woodworkers rely on table saws to make straight accurate cuts, which can either be through the wood, dividing it into two pieces, or into the wood, but not all the way through. Through cuts, both rip and cross cuts, can be done with the blade guard attached. However, non-through cuts, which go into the piece but do not go all the way through, like the dado cut and rabbit cut shown on this slide, require removal of the blade guard. In, uh, in 1971, table saws listed by UL were protected by this type of device. It consists of a single piece blade guard, this part, um, together with a splitter and anti-kickback pawls the splitter prevents the cut wood from closing on the blade. And these anti-kickback pawls are barbs that allow the workpiece to pass in the correct direction, but which dig in if the piece reverses direction. This whole system is removed from the, from the table saw as a unit. Uh, so when the blade guard is removed, uh, for instance, for a non-through cut, the whole uh, safety device with all of those parts of the safety device are removed. The UL standard was updated in 2007 with an effective date of January 2010. And now current saws, uh, like the ones in front of you, uh, use a modular blade guard and a riving knife. The modular blade guard uh, was designed to provide a better view of the workpiece and to be easy to remove and reinstall. Importantly, the riving knife, and, and you can see this in the picture, uh, moves up and down with the blade and can remain in place when the modular blade guard is removed. 
and that provides some protection against kickback, as well as some uh, blade contact protection from the rear. UL987 has been the voluntary standard and is currently transitioning to UL62841-3-1. And this is being done for international harmonization. Both UL987 and 62841-3-1 require the riving knife and modular blade guard. Neither of them require AIM technology, which I will discuss shortly. Currently, manufacturers can list to either of these standards until August of 2019, when 62841-3-1 becomes effective. We analyzed emergency department treated injury incidents from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, or NICE. In 2015, there were an estimated 33,400 table saw related emergency department treated injuries. Of those, 92% or 30,800 injuries were related to table saw blade contact. As you can see, that includes 18,100 lacerations. 5,900 fractures, 4,700 amputations, and 2,000 avulsions. Compared to all other consumer products in the NICE, table saw blade contact accounts for 18.6% of all amputations. And compared to other workshop products, which include circular saws and band saws, drills, manual tools, etc., Table saw blade contact counts for 52.4% of all amputations related to workshop products. Also, older consumers are injured by blade contact, and the estimated mean age of table saw blade contact victims is 55.6 years old, which is about 13 years older than the estimated mean age for victims involved in all other workshop product injuries, which is 42.7 years. Our epidemiology staff analyzed incidents from 2004 to 2015 and found no discernible change in either the number of table saw blade contact injuries or the risk of table saw blade contact injuries from 2004 to 2015. This includes the years before and after the modular blade guard was required in the voluntary standard. In addition to our national estimates, staff analyzed incident reports in our Consumer Product Safety Risk Management System, or CPSRMS. These 53 reports are anecdotal and cannot be used to make national estimates. However, they do provide more detailed information. In 45 of the incidents, we know what type of blade guard was manufactured with the saw, and 11 of those were modular blade guards. And with both modular and traditional blade guards, we saw the same types of accident scenarios, operator behavior, and severe life-changing injuries. We considered the human factors associated with blade contact. Blade guards are removed for non-through cuts and also for preference to see the cut better. Blade contact can also occur with the guard in place. Sudden stock movement can be unexpected and can cause a loss of control and the hand can contact the blade. Hands can also be close to the blade for small cuts, especially if a push stick is not used. Fatigue, here's a, what a push, push stick looks like. Fatigue and inattention can also cause blade contact. Also, older adults with age-related deficits may be more susceptible. However, we cannot quantify how much. These injuries can be reduced through various types of active injury mitigation. Active injury mitigation, or AIM, supplements the blade guard and riving knife and consists of two parts. First, there must be some system to detect the contact between the human body and the blade. And this detection could be based on electrical, thermal, optical, or other properties. Secondly, once the system has detected the blade contact, it needs to have some mechanism to react and mitigate the injury.
One example of a detection system is to use an electrical signal and uh, monitoring of that to detect. Uh, there are two uh, AIMS uh, equipped saws in front of you, and each of them uses an electrical uh, detection signal. Um, also, oops, oh, we're switching back and forth, but um, on, the, uh, on the slide in the rather complicated uh, diagram there, uh, it's meant to illustrate that um, the, there's a characteristic electrical signal coupled to the saw blade. Um, and that's monitored by the saw's computer. Contact to the blade by the human body changes the signal in a way which can be detected and differentiated from wood. And that can be used to trigger a response. Uh, one example of a reaction mechanism is to retract the saw blade beneath the surface of the table. Again, both of the aim systems in front of you retract the blade saws after triggering, although they do so in different ways with different uh, mechanisms. The one on, let's see, the right, uh, well, your left, my right, sorry, sorry, uh, is, uh, up, accomplishes this by applying a spring-loaded aluminum block into the saw blade to rapidly stop the blade and use the angular momentum from that to drive the uh, blade under the table. The one on your right, my left, uh, from another manufacturer, accomplishes this by activating a cartridge which combusts a pyrotechnic material, uh, much like an airbag activation. And uh, with that, fires a piston, which causes the blade to retract below the table. Staff recommends a performance standard for active injury mitiga mitigation, which requires that the maximum depth of cut to a test probe representing the human body or finger be three and a half millimeters when that probe is introduced radially to the uh, rotating saw blade at a rate of one meter per second. Staff believes that three and a half millimeters depth of cut is sufficient to avoid microsurgery on nerves and arteries based on the anatomy of human fingers. And staff believes that a one meter per second uh, approach velocity is appropriate for a performance test uh, for the radial component of the hand's approach velocity. And it's also uh, notable that this is uh, twice as fast as the calculated rate in more than a thousand activations which were recorded by saw stop. <coughs> Importantly, staff found that this performance standard is feasible. Testing of the two AIM technologies currently available showed that they could limit the depth of cut to the test probe to less than three millimeters when approached at one meter per second. Staff conducted a preliminary regulatory analysis and considered the societal costs associated with table saw blade contact. Based on estimates from NICE and the CPSC's injury cost model, there were an estimated 54,800 medically treated blade contact injuries in 2015, including 30,800 initially treated in hospital emergency departments, and another 24,000 which were treated elsewhere, such as physicians' offices, clinics, and ambulatory sur surgery centers. Societal, societal costs of these injuries amounted to about $4 billion in 2015. About 30% of those societal costs were economic losses, medical costs, and work loss, and about 70% represented the intangible costs associated with pain and suffering. Amputations accounted for about 13.7% of all medically treated injuries, but almost two-thirds of the injury costs. Staff analyzed the expected benefits of the draft proposed rule. It would reduce blade contact injuries by an estimated 70% to 90% annually. This would result in an expected gross benefit range of about $2,300 to $4,300 per table saw over its expected product life, or an aggregate of about $970 million to $2.45 billion over the product life of one year of sales.
Staff also looked at the expected costs of the draft proposed rule. And these would range from about $230 to $540 per bench saw, $375 to $925 per contractor saw, and $400 to $950 per cabinet saw. The aggregate annual costs could range from about $168 million to $345 million per year. Staff believes that the higher retail prices associated with meeting the draft proposed rule uh, would reduce market sales by as much as 14 to 38 percent, which is 90,000 to 250,000 saws per year. And this would result in a lost consumer surplus for consumers who choose not to purchase a new saw because of the higher prices, which could amount to $10 million to $70 million per year. Staff also considered royalty and licensing issues. <coughs> Manufacturers will likely license the existing patented AIM technology. The royalty rates or other terms of potential licensing agreements are uncertain. Assuming a royalty fee of 8% of the wholesale price, royalties could average about $37 to $57 per table saw, $99 to $135 per contractor saw, and $187 to $223 for cabinet saws. In total, given the expected table saw sales and an 8% royalty fee, aggregate royalty fees could amount to about $30 million to $35 million per year. Based on staff's benefit and cost estimates, the net benefits, which are the benefits minus the costs, for the market as a whole was estimated to be about $1,500 to $4,000 per saw. And these aggregate net benefits would amount to about $625 million to $2.3 billion over the product life of one year of table saw sales. A break-even analysis suggested that the benefits would exceed the cost for each major type of table saw, bench, contractor, and cabinet, for most plausible injury patterns. Staff conducted an initial regulatory flexibility analysis. Small manufacturers of table saws mostly manufacture the contractor and cabinet saws. Table saw manufacturers would be required to license or develop AIM technology to remain in the market and some firms are likely to reduce or eliminate the table saws they currently offer or leave the market. Therefore, the draft proposed rule will likely have a significant impact on small manufacturers. One small manufacturer, SawStop, could significantly benefit from the proposed rule. The preliminary regulatory analysis and the regulatory flexibility analysis identified several alternatives to the draft proposed rule including pursue table saw voluntary standards activities, extend the effective dates of a possible rule, exempt certain categories of table saws from the draft proposed rule, limit the applicability of the performance requirements to some, but not all, table saws, or pursue an information and education campaign to better inform the public of the hazards of blade contact and the benefits of the AIM technology. UL 987 and 62841-3-1 will not adequately reduce the risk of blade contact injuries because the riving knife and modular blade guard do not adequately reduce the risk of blade contact injury. No change was seen in injury or risk of injury before and after the introduction of the modular blade guard. There were at least 11 reported blade contact incidents on table saws equipped with modular blade guards. We saw similar injuries occur on table saws that were sold with modular and traditional blade guards. The blade guards are not always used and blade contact can occur when the blade guards are in place. Also, UL 987 and 62841-3-1 do not require AIM systems. In making preliminary findings, the Commission can consider frequency and severity of injuries. There were an estimated 30,800 emergency department treated blade contact injuries in 2015, 
involving approximately 18,100 lacerations, 5,900 fractures, 4,700 amputations, and 2,000 avulsions. The adequacy of the voluntary standard. Modular blade guards and riving knives do not adequately reduce the risk of blade contact injury. The amenability of the hazard to injury reduction. AIM can reduce severity of blade contact injury from amputation to simple laceration. Cost and benefit of CPSC action. The estimated net benefits average $1,500 to $4,000 per table saw or $625 million to $2.3 million per year. And alternatives. Less burdensome alternatives would not adequately reduce blade contact injuries on table saws. Therefore, staff recommends this, that the commission publish an NPR as drafted by the Office of General Counsel to address blade contact injuries on table saws. And staff recommends an effective date of 36 months after publication of a final rule for manufacturers to comply with the requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all again for being here today. So uh, I will begin, that, the, that ends our briefing, and I will begin the round of questioning. As I mentioned, uh, each commissioner will have 10 minutes per round. Um, so I want to talk a little bit uh, about um, the saw stop and the complaint that they filed against Bosch. There was an ITC decision. Can you brief us on the status of that matter? Sure. So on January 27th of 2017, the ITC determined that there was an infringement of SawStop's patents by Bosch. There were two patents that were involved. The ITC determined that the appropriate remedy is a limited exclusion order prohibiting the entry of table saws that incorporate the AIM system and in order that the Bosch company to cease and desist from importing, selling, aim, and components that infringe on such patents. The last day for the president, through his USTR representative, to review the ITC determination is 60 days from January 27th. So in this case, that period ends on March 28th, 2017. The order will go into effect on March 29th, 2017. We note that um, the commission orders can be appealed at uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So that is the current status of the ITC proceeding. Thank you. Dr. Recht, when you were showing us the two uh, AIM technologies, the two types of uh, technology, you talked about the spring-loaded. So one is a mitigation and one is um, a detection technology? Um, so so the, the AIM systems include two parts. One part of any AIM system is detection to n notice that it's a, a finger, not a piece of wood. And the second part of any AIM system is some reaction to it. Um, then there can be different types of detection systems. There could be different types of reactions. Right. Thank you. And, and of the two, the, the two parts that you talked to us about, who owns the technology? Is there any, anyone else besides SawStop who has that capability based on this ITG, ITC decision? Um, well, so we, we're not aware of other technologies besides these on the marketplace. Uh, as far as the portions of that that were So you're asking if there's any other um, manufacturer who has the same technology that SawStop is using for detection. Um, in the ITC proceeding, the commission found that um, Bosch was in violation of two of the SawStop patents. And those two patents were uh, related to the retraction method rather than the electrical detection method. So um, I, 
I don't think that that case definitively shows that there aren't other methods of even electrical detection signals that a manufacturer could develop in the future. Thank you. Um, how will the ID, ITC decision affect our rulemaking, if at all? Currently, we are waiting to see what happens with that proceeding. But for the purposes of the proposed rule and moving forward, um, we, I think that it would not have a, a significant impact on us in, in terms of changing the scope of the current rule. Thank you. The uh, NPR talks and actually states that SawStop has filed more than 100 patents. Um, and it mentions that some will uh, expire over a period of time. Do we have knowledge or information of all of those patents and when they will expire? So the whole web of patents that have been filed by SawStop is extremely extensive. Um, I can't say that we've looked at more than the current ones that were before the ITC commission. But we know that the, in order to determine the termination dates of any patents is an extremely laborious and extensive process that a layperson would not be able to accomplish. It's so, it's so burdensome that the ITC asked SawStop to tell it's, it when their patents would expire. So we do not know when uh, the majority of the SawStop patents will expire. And to evaluate any one of those expiration dates would take a huge amount of time and expertise that we currently in our commission don't have. Have we asked SawStop to provide that information to us that they're providing to ITC? Um, they provided that information to ITC, so we know that for the two infringed upon patents, they expire on 2020 and 2022. And are, is SawStop going to provide that same information to us? Uh, we haven't asked. Um, we have knowledge of the expiration through the ITC commission um, ALJ order. Okay, thank you. Um, the NPR distinguishes and talks quite a bit about simple lacerations, those involving damage only from the skin surface to a depth of about two millimeters to four millimeters. I'm not sure which one of you is going to answer the medical questions. Um, and then dis distinguishes between the complex and the simple lacerations, the complex being cuts that are deeper than four millimeters. In 2015, Dr. Reck, you mentioned that there were an estimated 18,100 lacerations from table saws. Do we know how many of these were simple and complex? Was that a distinction made in the course of um, collecting that data? We're going to have that be come up to answer that question. Thank you. Hi. So the. <clears throat> So for the, the 18,100, 18, that was based off of the information from the NICE. So we just have the diagnosis code of laceration. And um, that although occasionally a NICE narrative might, that the comments in the NICE might give further details, they have limited space. So it's very rare that we would know any details about the type of laceration. Would we know that there were stitches involved, that there was... We don't have, so um, within the NICE, we don't have what treatments, we don't have any kind of treatment codes for what, how the, what, how the, uh, how any of the injuries were treated. Just the one, just the diagnosis code. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Reck, you mentioned this as well as the NPR, that in some cases it was, um, the blade guard was removed. And you mentioned the um, non-through cuts, the dado and the rabbit cuts. Um, are we confident that, that those numbers are correct in terms of when they occasionally, the, the NPR says some sauce users, users occasionally or even always remove the blade. Now you mentioned two specific situations, um, the two non-through cuts. Right, so we, we, we know that it's necessary to remove the blade for non-through cuts, uh, the blade guard, pardon me, uh, for non-through cuts. 
Um, the, we did a uh, modular blade guard survey, um, which was a, 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 a survey of 200 table saw users um, who either owned a table saw manufactured after 2009 or later or were very familiar with them. Um, that indicated that there were uh, blade guards are removed. It, it, it looked at different ways. So some people, there was questions about for do you ever remove them? There were questions about do you remove them for non-through cuts? Um, and so it, it, it shows that there are cases where, where they are removed. Uh, as far as providing a definitive answer of how often they are removed, um, it's not a generalizable study. Um, it was a, not a statistical uh, survey in that way. So do we have that information from any, I mean, have we glean that information anywhere else that it could be statistically valid that we could say in this many cases we know that the, the saw guard was removed? Because I think that that's important information if we're looking at the scope of injuries with a table saw. If they took off the table guard, then how, I'll leave it at that, I'll, I'll ask, let you answer. Um. We have, inf so again, not uh, in the modular blade guard survey, one of the questions uh, was about uh, how af after you remove the blade guard for a non-through cut, uh, I believe was the question, when do you put it back on? And the answer to that was a range also, and it, it, I guess some people put it on right after they finish the non-through cut, and other people the next time they use the saw, and other people it was later at, at a convenient time. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Commissioner Adler. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I just wanted to make a very quick short comment before I again begin. First of all, thank you to the staff for uh, all the years you've spent to uh, giving me advice and feedback and information about this, uh, particularly Caroline. Uh, and thank you all for doing a very exhaustive and uh, I think excellent package. Um, I note that Dr. Gass and his colleagues petitioned us in April 2003 to adopt a performance standard for saws that would incorporate what we now call AIM technology. That's 14 years ago. In that time, you can do a rough estimate, but somewhere on the order of 700 plus thousand injuries and 50,000 plus amputations have occurred. Uh, even as we're sitting here today, during this day, across the land, on average, 11 consumers are going to suffer an amputation, another 11 will suffer a fracture, and another, another eight will suffer serious lacerations. And that's just to put it into context that we're talking about real human beings and real injuries. So now to my mundane questions. Uh, the first one is, I noticed in making the injury, es injury estimates, you used non-NICE data as well as NICE data. Where did you get the non-NICE data from, and is that what you would consider to be equally reliable uh, data as the injury information we get from NICE? <laughs> So are you referring to the CPSRMS? I am. No, okay. not, no, no. I'm referring to the uh, injury cost model. Oh, I will let Econ <laughs> take my place. <laughs> ah, off the hook. Uh, the the non-NICE or medically treated injuries are, are calculated based on relationships gleaned from two uh, uh, HHS nationally uh, sponsored uh, data sources uh, for the um, uh, less severe injuries, uh, the ones treated in doctor's offices and clinics. These are based on analysis of data from the medic medical expenditure panel survey uh, um, from the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality. And for um, the um, um, the admitted injuries that bypass the emergency room, it's uh, estimated from uh, the um, national, this is, this is a mouthful, you'll have to excuse me, the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project and the National Inpatient Sample. 
So in both these cases, a uh, classification tree or um, decision tree uh, technique is used to analyze the injuries, which which creates these real, or, or gets these relationships. Uh, in, in the first case, we have to. Um, uh, Maybe I can cut to the chase, sure, wrong metaphor, sure. but d how reliable are these data? Are these data, t in your mind, as reliable as the data we get from NICE? Uh, we haven't, uh, I, I think they're uh, reliable, but we don't have the covariance, we don't have the, um, the same confidence in, from, in, in interval information that we have for the NICE, but, um, uh, yes, I think they're reliable. And it, th this is sir, the injury cost model is something we've been using for years, and we use it in with the res with respect to the development of other standards. Is that accurate? For many years now. Yes. Okay. Um, we did t two special studies, uh, both of which turned out to be unsuccessful special studies to try to ascertain the type of model of saw that was associated with injuries and. I understand that the field and epidemiology are conducting a new study designed to fix the problems of the previous special studies. Can you explain what we're doing with the new study and what we're doing to try to avoid the problems that arose with the previous special studies? I think that's a, sir. Because the two studies had inconsistencies on um, the SAW classification, and they were conducted by the telephone, and we determined that, again, it wasn't reliable on the self-declared type regardless of the definitions we supplied. So to counter that aspect, the study that's ongoing now, um, the field staff are actually uh, trying to go to the injured individual's home and take a picture of the saw which was associated with the injury so we don't have to rely on the respondent discriminating between one type or the other. And, and we um, have started that. Again, they're based on the NICE cases um, starting in January 17. And there will also be the field, in essence, is conducting an IDI. We did, again, have a field protocol developed. And EPI did train the um, field inspectors as a group as to what types of saws, what to look for, the questions to ask. Um, and so we think that those aspects are indeed, by design, going to counter the issues that we had over the telephone, non-visual type of discussion. So when this new study is completed, do you think it's fair to say that we will be able to make a proper determination of the types of saws involved in injuries? That's the objective of this new approach. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Carolina a question. Is it okay, uh, even though you're suffering from jet lag? Um, I keep hearing hints and snippets about the injuries on bench saws versus cabinet saws that there's a suggestion that cabinet saws might account for more injuries per saw than bench saws. Now, if there's anybody who's looked at the bench saw design and the cabinet saw design, it is Caroline Paul. So I guess my question is, just with respect to the engineering design, the design only, not the use patterns, just with respect to the engineering design, is there anything in the basic design of a bench saw that is safer than the engineering design of a cabinet saw? Oh. Well, it's part engineering design. and and who you are as a woodworker. So that there are intertwined. So in terms of engineering design, something can be perfectly parallel to something else or perpendicular. And in that instance, in terms of a cabinet saw, 
you have a product that is highly engineered to have a flat surface, a rip fence that's parallel, and all of these are things that a woodworker would tell you that prevent kickback. A bench saw, by design, has a smaller tabletop and will have a, a rip fence that is of less quality. Uh, so here's the hypothetical. If all cabinet saw users switch to bench saws, do you have any reason to believe they would then suffer fewer injuries because they're using bench saws and not using cabinet saws? That's a hypothetical. That's a hypothetical, yeah. I can only Based say on your knowledge of engineers and engineering, I mean of engineering design of table saws. Based on physics and the engineering design, if you have something that is more true and you have a piece of wood that is going through a blade that's less likely to come out of true, then it will be less likely to have kickback. On which one? Whichever one is more true and, and more I accurate. see. And which one is based on your knowledge of bench saws and cabinet saws, which one? Um, I guess most woodworkers would tell you the cabinet saw. All right, we got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, then uh, I'm not going to be able to have time to ask this next question. Um, I guess uh, just a general question. Um, there are a variety of injury scenarios that occur when somebody's using a table saw. This is not necessarily a question for Ms. Paul. As I review the scenarios, I have trouble seeing how any of them really result from significant consumer misuse. Uh, but we do have this whole issue of blade guards and uh, the removal of blade guards. And Joel, when I looked at the briefing package, that study, which you say is not statistically representative, said that um, the something, something on the order of 60 percent of uh, people surveyed uh, do remove the uh, blade guard, and it said sometimes 28 percent, often 17 percent, and always 14 percent. And yet you explained, and I'm just going to ask you quickly to explain again. Uh, no, I'm not. I've just run out of time, but I'll come back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. And I really want to thank a staff, and I see so many back there who were involved in putting this package together. Um, and thank you very much for the meeting with me and for your, um, uh, your attempts to give me very honest answers. And I really um, want to thank you also for the candor in both the package and in your responses in our meeting with respect to the deficiencies we know we have in our data and the effects on the analyses that you were asked to perform. And I think that's very helpful in terms of us making a decision of how we should proceed. Um, one quick question. Uh, there, was, uh, there were alternative actions contemplated in the NPR that excluded cabinet and contrary so contractor saws from the mandatory standards, but, standard, but I didn't see anything that considered the alternative excluded, of excluding bench saws. Can somebody tell me why? I knew you were back there. I just couldn't see you. Uh, the reason bench saws weren't included in that category was because most bench saws are probably used by consumers. Uh, contractor saws and cabinet saws are more likely to be used by professional users. Consequently, if the commission wanted to limit uh, the standard to, you know, some specific types of saws. Uh, if you were going to exclude some, it would probably be most reasonable to exclude the, the saws that are more likely to be used by professionals. That makes sense. Thank you. And um, there is an estimate in the package, and, and uh, Dr. Recht, you, you mentioned it as well, that the effectiveness of the AIM technology, uh, specifically saw stop and the Bosch reacts of 70 to 90 percent. Can you tell it, tell me what data you base that on? Uh, yeah. Uh, we tried to, well, it, it's difficult to know precisely how many injuries are going to be prevented. Uh, but in this case, we tried to think of the ways in which injuries would not be prevented. And we came up with a, a list. Uh, for example, in some cases, the hand may be, f for some reason, may be flying at the saw so quickly that, uh, uh, that the saw will cause a lot of damage even though it has the AIM technology on it. That's a possibility in some cases. Uh, sometimes the AIM is deactivated if you're cutting wet wood or, 
or wood that maybe, or, or if you're cutting something that's conductive like aluminum. So sometimes people are going to be turning the uh, uh, AIM system off. Uh, the use of the AIM system may in fact result in other changes in safety behavior uh, in the form of reducing safety efforts for other other pro potential problems. For example, if you think that the saw is going to protect you from blade contact, for some reason you might not think it's so important to have a riving knife, which can you know affect kickback, or you might not wear goggles and things might fly into your eyes. So there's a possibility uh, that people could reduce their safety efforts. We don't really have any evidence of that at this point, uh, but that's a possibility. And actually there were some comments uh, that we got for the ANPR that suggested that that might be the case. And then there's also a risk associated with substitute products. If, for example, you stopped, if you didn't buy a, a table saw with AIM technology because it was so expensive, you might use something else like a hand saw, and that might, have, that might lead to more risky behavior in some circumstances. Okay. And, and then, of course, as the engineers indicate over and over again, this doesn't actually prevent injuries, it just mitigates them. Mitigates them substantially, but there will be some, some injury. Okay. Uh, so the 90%, we assume that uh, the remainder that might be not prevented were about 10%. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, I know that the big, huge hole that we have in our um, data right now is the type of table saw that is actually involved in in causing injuries. And I know we've tried in 07, uh, 07 and 08 and from data in 14 and 15 and surveys to find this out. And I know that they've both been deemed unreliable and all of the information from them was disregarded. So in the absence of information identifying which saws caused injuries, I know that you pursued the break-even analysis. And again, thank you for your candor on, on what the problems are with this. Um, you set up four hypotheticals. Um, one was injuries are proportional to saws in use, and every table saw has an equal likelihood of injury. You have the second one of risks of all are equal over their lives. The third one is risk is proportional to their retail sales price. The fourth one is blade contact injuries by table saw type are proportional to the median retail uh, prices. Um, and I appreciate you did the best you could, but without information on saw type, um, we, may, we know that it very well may be that none of those are assumptions are right. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, so in order to, be co to, to complete a more fulsome cost-benefit analysis, it's my understanding from our discussion the other day that what you need to know to do a more fulsome cost-benefit analysis is, first of all, if there was blade contact, and uh, I'll just comment that I'm satisfied from, from the package and from Ms. Garland's comments that our nice people, have been, our, our epi people rather, have been very careful in, and conservative in selecting um, nice data that in where there has been blade contact. The second thing is severity of injuries, and we know we could get that from the nice data. And so the, the third thing that you're missing is the type of saw, and you need that in order to correlate it with one and two. Is that yeah, fair well, to I'd say? say the first one, you said exactly correctly. Uh, we'd have a more definitive... Did I only get one out of three? Well, 90%, let's okay. say. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but the second item is we don't really know what the distribution of injuries is. In other words, what, per, what percentage of injuries occur on table uh, bench saws, what proportion happen on uh, cabinet saws right. and so forth. Right. The third is, is the severity issue. Right. If we had the nice injury estimates by table saw type, right. we'd be able to figure out what types of injuries were occurring on each table saw. Right. And that gets at the severity. The break-even uh, analysis kind of deals with item number two. The, and I think that the break-even analysis shows that, uh, that regardless of what the injury distribution it is, it looks like uh, probably the benefits would be greater than the costs for, for uh, all, the, all of the different saw types. I understand that, and, and, the, with the, and I understand the premises that, that you used because you did a great job of explaining that, and I appreciate it. Let me say that we know that exempting contractor and cabinet saws would lessen the impact on small manufacturers and that it would reduce possible OSHA jurisdiction overlap. 
but we have no information on how many contractor and cabinet saws are involved in consumer injuries. We know that. Page two and three, pages two and three of tab C sums up our problems with not having this survey da data. And um, the costs outweigh benefits in some saw types. So to do our analysis, um, you told us that with no data on this, you made assumptions on the number of injuries that could be pre prevented, the hypothetical distribution of injuries across saw types, and the expected post-regulatory sales, right? Right. Okay. Um, as you know, um, my office um, just found out that there was this flaw that has been known to at least a couple of commissioners for many months, but we just found out about it and since then have been spending an enormous amount of energy circling how we might be able to correct what seems like a really basic data element, and that is the kind of saw that's used. Now, I guess I have a couple questions with respect to these previous surveys. Um, and let me focus first, and this may be something for, probably something for, for Epi. Um, but the, the, in 2007 and 2008, the flaws as they were described in the package were because the interviewers were asking cons confusing questions so that people's responses were such that you, you could end up with a conflict with respect to the saw types. But I just learned yesterday that a number of the, the reports, the 821 sample um, injuries from the 07-08 have the manufacturer name and I just, I, I guess I knew that, but what I didn't know is that a number of these manufacturers only made one type of saw. So I guess my question is, I understand that we need to exclude the subjective information because of the questions asked and the answers given, but has anyone gone through these 821 reports that we have to see if we have any objective information with respect to saw type, whether it's manufacturer, whether it's a photo, um, whatever it is. I just wonder if anybody's tried to do that. Right. Uh, we have looked at that and, and we're in the process of uh, getting that answer okay. uh, in a way that we can get it to you probably tomorrow or the next day. Terrific. Um, um, and then I guess I have really the same questions. Uh, well, if we were able to have, I guess I have to ask the follow-up to that, if we, except that I have three more seconds, so I'll wait until the next round. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Kay. Thanks, Madam Chair. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to thank the staff for a phenomenal job. I thought it was a very strong package. Certainly, as Commissioner Adler mentioned, uh, time continues to tick and uh, consumers deserve some type of response to the, this ongoing injury pattern, whether it's this particular rulemaking or some other one. To, uh, but I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, staff, also, uh, for the amount of time that you've spent addressing some very specific questions that uh, I've offered over the course of uh, a couple of weeks, and those answers have been shared uh, with my colleagues on the Commission. And um, it's, a, it's an area of interest for me in doing a deeper dive, looking at, uh, from a compare-contrast point of view, the ANPR uh, and the NPR. And uh, I think some of those elements would be worth uh, going into in a little bit greater detail here, as I think I'm not the only one looking at uh, uh, how different the, uh, the, the net benefits and the benefits uh, uh, as they were identified between the ANPR and the NPR. So in terms of looking at some of the leading indicators to drive the benefits part of our cost-benefit analysis, I first wanted to look at the table saw, blade contact, injury trend analysis. And that really gets to uh, a look, I think, at what was intended to be a study of the effectiveness of the modular blade guard uh, that, uh, that went in in a, in a voluntary standard. Uh, and I apologize if you mentioned this in the briefing, but do you know what year that went into effect, or when we would imagine probably the better number, when products in the marketplace were likely to have the modular blade guard? So, so the, the, the voluntary standard with the modular blade guard became effective January 2010, around in, in 2009 they started appearing in the, in the market. Oh, um, in advance, of course, right, yeah. Uh, People saw it coming. And then obviously it takes some time for them to penetrate the market, um, but we went all the way through to 2015. Um, and, and by which time there, there were uh, many 
you know, of, of these slots yeah. in the there, market. There's some overlap, so, but by 2010, everyone was providing. We would have expected sizes. to be penetration for new product sales to include the modular, modular blade guard. Correct. Great. Thank you, uh, Ms. Paul. And, yeah, and we yielded, we looked at the, at the blade contact injury trend per 10,000 saws in the marketplace. And uh, maybe to our disappointment, the, the quote that I want to reference, and, and that was in the presentation from earlier today, no discernible change in the risk of injury associated with the table saw blade contact. So uh, that leads us to believe that the, uh, that the changes made in that, uh, in that latest version of the UL standard didn't have the impact that we were hoping in terms of addressing um, uh, the risk. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So the rates of injuries have been the same. If there was a discernible trend, uh, I know the package mentions that, <laughs> that we don't see a discernible trend. If there were one, what would be the kind of reduction that we might be able to look to and say, well, you know, perhaps the uh, modular guard is, uh, and, other, and other efforts, education or, or anything else, um, is having an impact? Is there a percentage that we might suggest that, uh, that, that leads us to believe that it is having a beneficial safety impact? I would have Sarah speak to trend analysis because it's a... If that's too difficult to answer to, I would accept a, that's too hard to come down with a number. Well, um, I don't necessarily have an, an, an exact number. Right. But um, as the time progresses away from when the voluntary standard went into effect, we should expect us to have a larger percentage in each year of, of saws in use to be there. And um, that I want to quote an econ number, but I don't know if they'll... If if they're okay with me, is it okay if I say yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> By 2015, um, they, they estimate about a third of the, of the cells in use should have been, uh, should be compliant. Ah, thank you. Okay, well, that, that's a helpful transition uh, because I did want to talk about the number of saws in, the, in population. So um, I discovered we have a CPSC product population model. Um, can you want to briefly uh, describe for us what that, what that is? Or maybe how long that's been, um, how long we've had the benefit of that model? The acronym is PPM. PPM. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. Uh, since the 80s. We've had the model since, since the, the 80s. 80s. Yeah, yeah. And it basically it uses um, uh, estimates of uh, expected life. And um, uh, there are certain things that go into the parameters for the, for the distribution. There are several distributions that are available. We tend to use a gamma. But not to get down in the weeds. Anyway, to simplify, well, what it does is it projects out the life of the product according to, um, uh, as I said, shipments, mm -hmm. annual shipments, which we've gotten from product there. life, et cetera. And then and failure then, rate, and I think, is the way it's failure, described. Exactly, failure rates, so that uh, um, we can make a, pro uh, a, a projection of the population of saws in use for each year. So. Um, that, that's a simple And then answer. that yields, okay, terrific. And I noticed that from the ANPR, the PPM yielded a result of 10 million products in use, table saws in scope to the rule. And then in 2015, that number was reduced 18% to 8.2 8 million saws, according to the, to the PPM. Um, and that's on page 15 of tab C. So the third element of a leading indicator I want to address is the blade contact injuries. Now from the staff briefing package, both from our NICE data from, uh, of addressable blade contact injuries. Uh, we've got 30,800 from NICE plus another 24,000, as Commissioner Adler got to from our non-NICE data for a total of 54,800. In the ANPR, uh, we had a total of, I think, 67,300. Uh, that is 33,000 and a half from NICE. 33.8 from non-NICE. So between the ANPR and the NPR, the addressable blade contact injuries went down 20% uh, between the ANPR and the NPR. So um, I don't think I can ask this question without some help from a visual aid. And Dr. Recht, I think there's some slides that'll help get to the big question that I want you to answer here. Uh, that first, with the total population of saws, in use down uh, almost 20 percent. So those are the saws from the PPM gone down 19 percent, excuse me, and then next slide if you will, 
Dr. Rack. The blade contact injuries were down 20% between the ANPR and the NPR. And finally, next slide please, the rate of table saw injury remaining the same. And then the third saw, third slide, yet after all these decreases and a stable rate of injury, we're finding the achievable benefits have surprisingly gone up 72% from the ANPR to the NPR. And I know you've given me a 10-page document to describe that, uh, but for a lot of other interesting players uh, playing along at home, given those other leading indicators all going down by significant numbers or staying flat, one would expect that the achievable benefits would have commensurately gone down or remained flat, yet they went up 72%. Uh, can you provide uh, for, I guess, the record uh, how that, uh, how those benefits uh, increase 72 percent? Well, there are, se there are se several things going on with the injury cost model since the ANPR. Uh, first of all, uh, the ANPR used 2008 as the price level. The current estimate uh, uses $2,014. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that about 45% of the uh, 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 increase from uh, the uh, uh, ANPR to the NPR is related to price level adjustments plus mm -hmm. updates to the injury cost model that we've incorporated over the last several years. I think we've incorporated about uh, four updates over the time period. And it's kind of like a, you take a car to get it worked on and they, they fix uh, the wheels one time and, okay. and the generator the next time. Well, we kind of add things to the injury cost model as, as, as we can get better information. So about 45% was related to the increase in price level from 2008 to 2014 mm -hmm. and updates in the uh, injury cost model. About 55% was related to the increase in hospitalizations uh, relative to the ANP, the ANP, in the ANPR, about 4.2 percent of the there, about 14.2 percent of the injuries were hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. That went up to 19.2 percent, 9.2 percent in uh, the NPR. So a little bit more than doubled. Plus, there was an increase in amputations for some reason that we're not clear on. I'm short on time, and I appreciate that. But that's why I want to get this out. The quotes that we just saw before is there is no discernible change in the number of injuries or the type of injuries related to table saw blade contact from 2004 to 2015. Yet you just said the type of injury amputations have gone up significantly as well as hospitalization. So how do we, um, how do we align that quote with what you just uh, well, mentioned? Well, uh, you know, I don't know the full answer to that question. Part of it is epidemiology just looks at the numbers of injuries where we're looking at you know, the cost of those injuries. Uh, and there was a substantial increase in uh, the number of uh, hospitalizations over that time period. Uh, and there was an increase in amputations, though significant, it was about a 2% increase in amputations. But since amputations account for, well, since they only amount to about 13.7% of injuries, and almost two-thirds of the injury costs, a small increase in amputations can increase the injury costs quite a bit. In this case, $430 million. We consider that non-discernible? Non-what? Uh, not discernible? No discernible change? I'm sorry, well, I'm way over time. Well, it's, it, it's discernible we'll to us, but we're not right. looking at it in a statistical approach. Okay. I'm sorry I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Um, I want to go back to what we, I was talking about a little bit ago uh, in terms of the lacerations because I'm concerned um, that we're, we're really not getting to the root of the severity of the injury. And I did hear um, from Mr. Rogers or Dr. Rogers that um, we, we can, the type of saw will get us the severity information. And I wanted to kind of explore that a little bit. The question's from Commissioner Robinson. You mentioned that the, the type of saw will get us the severity information. But when we talked earlier with Dr. Recht, um, it was a question of if in the NICE code, we just talked about lacerations. We couldn't discern 
which was a, a severe or less severe laceration. So I'd like you to just comment and explain that type well, of stuff. When I say severity, kind of what I was really talking about was the cost of the injury. Uh, and I'm using cost as kind of a proxy for severity. Uh, so uh, if you have more amputations, that would make it a more severe injury. And I'm thinking of it because the injury costs go way up. Uh, we don't have, you know, technically a severity measure. Uh, but looking at, you know, the, the proportion of hospitalizations and the proportion of amputations, both of those going up to some extent, that would indicate an increase in severity to me. But what we don't know is if the different saws are affected differently by that, by that change. Uh, I mean, it could be, and this is just hypothetical, it could be that amputations tend to be treated, I mean, tend to occur with bench saws primarily uh, because people, the people that use them may be novices, they don't use it very often, whereas the cabinet and contractor saws tend to be used by more proficient users. Uh, but we don't know. I mean, it could, I mean, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that cabinet saws are used so much that uh, they may account for for the great ma majority of injuries or more injuries on a proportional basis if we had if we had the information from n nice as to what you know what type what what the injury pattern was for each of the, these saws it might turn out that and again this is purely hypothetical i don't know, have any idea whether it would would happen or not but it could be that the costs for the average cost we came up with is about $74,000 per injury. It could be that the injury cost might have averaged $100,000 per bench saw, but you know, $60,000 per cabinet saw. But we don't have that information. Uh, but that kind of information would affect our cost-benefit analysis, potentially. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to just go back to Commissioner Mohorovic's, because um, his line of questioning had a, the no discernible change. Uh, in the number of blade contact injuries from 2004 to 2015. Even if the number of lacerations hasn't changed, is there any way to know, and this goes back to my, my question, the, has there, is it possible there could have been a reduction in the, in the more complex lacerations rather than, um, so we say there was no discernible change, but could it have been that there was a, a, a decrease in the complex lacerations and an increase in the more simple lacerations. Is that possible? It's possible, but we have no way to, to quantify any of that. We don't have a way to know how, what it was before, or after, or even any current state. That we, we don't have a way to measure the complexity of what the laceration was. Okay. And even if those two nice special studies had not, we have, didn't have difficulties with the subjectivity and the asking of questions, we still wouldn't know that answer. Is that, is that fair to say? From, from those two special studies, yes. The current special study is attempting to <coughs> the current st um, study being conducted by our field investigator is requesting pictures and, um, and other um, medical information from the respondents to attempt to collect that type of information. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, if a table saw user uses a glove, how does that impact the AIMS technology? Uh, look, do you want to answer? Uh, on the, the current uh, AIMS uh, systems that are available uh, don't uh, begin to react until the conductive uh, part of the human body touches. So it, it would depend somewhat on the glove, but typically uh, gloves are not conductive and they're not going to react until uh, finger contact occurs um, using that current uh, system. Um, and the standard, that's what it says. So after blade contact, it must stop before three and a half millimeters of cutting into the finger or the, the test probe, actually. But uh, we don't specify cutting fingers. Thank you. Um, you, you alluded to this, or someone did, I'm not sure, about uh, the, and the NPR talks about it as well, there's situations when the AIM technology is going to be, dis going to be disabled uh, voluntarily because you're cutting through a, a conductive s s um, material or wet wood or something. And so can you, how common is that going to happen? 
Is that something that you should factor into this? Um, and and uh, 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 Greg mentioned that uh, uh, we did factor that into the effectiveness. Um, we know that some, you know, metal is cut on table saws. Uh, so that that is, uh, you know, we don't know exactly how much. Uh, one thing that these uh, systems do have, though, uh, as opposed to when one removes a modular blade guard, it remains removed until they replace it. But when the saw, uh, the power is cycled, it goes back into the uh, activating the uh, AIM system automatically. So th it, there's, um, it, it doesn't require a user input uh, on the next use of the saw to r return it to uh, AIMS. Okay, so you could disable it and then it would be ready to go the next time, the next time you use it? Is that, I, if I'm understanding you? When you turn off the saw and turn it back on, it, it, it automatically already. goes back to uh, having the AIM system activated. Okay. You and would have to keep disabling it. Yes, okay. But if you left it on, it would be disabled until you turned it off or you, okay. Um, the mention of OSHA was made by Commissioner Robinson, I believe. Um, and I'm just wondering, does OSHA have the jurisdiction and the authority to regulate table saws? Um, OSHA has some regulations currently that ensure a safer work environment for table saw users. Um, some of these regulations involve the use of guards or push sticks. So those regulations are primarily though to promote safe practices in the workplace rather than in the home environment. And they allow for training and outreach which the homeowner would not have access to. So I think the um, standards that OSHA requires would not really meet the safeguards available for consumers in the home environment. Thank you. But I think what we're considering here today is an overlap on some level because we're talking about commercial saws, we're talking about, so is there an overlap of the standard, or excuse me, of the rule developing? Yeah, there, there could be an overlap between OSHA and CPSC regulations, but we have under the CPSA, CPSA under Section 31, um, the statute says if um, a risk of injury can't be sufficiently addressed by OSHA, then the CPSC has also authority to regulate such a risk of injury. Thank you. Um, a, a very high proportion, and I think uh, this is for Mr. Or Dr. Rogers, and if you want to stay up at the table, it seems like we keep calling you up there. I know you probably don't want to, but <laughs> we'd love to have you at the table. Um, a very high proportion of the cost benefit and the benefit estimates relate to pain and suffering. Yes. And I, I'm wondering if, going back to my original question, do those, does that pain and suffering and suffering in that estimation, does is that related to obviously the lacerations, but it, does it distinguish again between that simple versus the complex laceration? Uh, to the extent, the uh, pain and suffering estimates are based on a regression analysis of uh, jury awards. And uh, one of the important, one of the factors that goes into the, is into the estimates is the type of injury that was involved. So. I can't remember precisely how lacerations fit into the model, but but there might be a, a variable that picks up laceration injuries. Uh, we wouldn't distinguish between severe and unsevere uh, lacerations, except to the extent that the model also includes an estimate of economic losses. I mean, that's one of the important factors of pain and suffering. And so presumably, if you had a more severe laceration, that's going to increase medical costs and lost wages. Uh, so that would implicitly, so it would implicitly impact on the uh, pain and suffering estimate that way, if that answers your question. Thank you. I'm out of time and I'll just pick up where we left off when I come back again. Thank you. Commissioner Adler. I just wanted to pick up on a point that Chairman Burkle is raising that when we're talking about lacerations, uh, at a minimum, these are lacerations that result in medically attended care. Either you're going to an emergency department or you're going to 
some kind of medical facility. So we're not really talking about things like paper cuts here. Am I correct in stating that? Probably, yeah. Although I hate paper cuts. <laughs> I mean, it, it's whatever. I, I mean, that's real pain and suffering. I mean, whatever people would go to a doctor to see. Yeah, I just assume most people don't go for paper cuts. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to comment just now on the pain and suffering. Uh, that's something I think Commissioner Robinson uh, knows well and, and knows what the calculations are from jury verdict uh, service. But I did want to go back to the break-even analysis because in the break-even analysis, you, you listed four hypotheticals. And my understanding is you listed a scenario in which bench saws produce more injuries because there are more of them uh, to scenarios in which cabinet saws have a higher rate of injury because people use them more. Uh, but you did state in the briefing package on tab C, page 58, that you tried to pick the most plausible injury distributions. And so I guess my question is, uh, are you satisfied that you picked uh, the most plausible, and are there other plausible uh, hypotheticals that you didn't uh, an analyze? Well, uh, I mean, you could continue thinking about plausible. We, what well, we that's tried what I'm to saying. Do, I'm limiting it to the term you used, plausible. You can think of some bizarre What, uh, what we tried to do was come up with an array of distributions that kind of co cover the gamut of possibilities. I mean, we tried to come up with some in which the risk on a bench saw was greatest and some where the risk on a cabinet saw was greatest because given that we don't know what type of saw is used and we don't know what the injury distribution is, we wanted to see how robust our findings were with respect to uh, these alternative injury scenarios. And so we tried to come up with, we came up with four that we thought were plausible and they kind of have a wide range of, of different risks for different saws. So I felt we were kind of comfortable that this covered yeah, and actually it looks to me like you covered the field of what, again, what I would call plausible injury scenarios. You did want, and by the way, in almost all of those, uh, the net benefits exceeded costs usually by a large amount. Uh, the one instance where the net benefits slightly exceeded, uh, excuse me, net costs slightly exceeded benefits, this was one, uh, I think it was hypothetical four, where you had to make an assumption that cabinet saws presented roughly 40 times the risk of a bench saw. Uh, even if cabinet saws uh, present greater risks, it seems to me 40 times the risk of a uh, bench saw is, is a pretty extreme one. So to me, that feels like you've covered the field, and I just thought I'd make that observation. But my question is, uh, assuming that the special study that's underway that we've heard described provides the missing information, is there any additional data you would need in order to do your cost-benefit analysis? No. Okay. Uh, and in fact, you've sort of done the cost-benefit analysis. You're just waiting to see which one of those uh, the uh, special study confirms. Plus also the costs on the specific type of sauce. Okay. Uh, and now I want to go back to uh, the uh, removal of blade guards. And again, the staff said that removal of blade guards is necessary and proper uh, on occasion. And uh, again, can you explain when and why this is justified? And uh, the reason I ask that is you said necessary and proper, meaning sometimes you just have to do that. Am I correct? Correct. If you take a woodworking class and you learn how to make a non-through cut, they go through the process of how to do so, and you use the top portion of the blade to cut partially into the wood, and you have to push the wood all the way across, and therefore you can't have the obstruction um, that's presented by the blade guard there. And even when you don't have to remove the blade guard, my understanding as uh, a complete novice is blade guards can interfere with a consumer's ability to make very precise cuts. Am I misstating that, or is that accurate? That can be somewhat subjective, and if you're making very narrow cuts, they can get in the way, and for some people, it's a visibility issue. And I heard the same thing about safety goggles, that uh, they can interfere with the consumer's ability to make a precise cut, and that probably varies from eyesight to eyesight. And I did notice that you said elderly seem to have more accidents. That obviously resonates with uh, these old bones up here. Uh, I did also want to ask, just in the question of any information you have with respect to consumer misuse, do you see a significant number of instances in which consumers are operating 
table saws under the influence of alcohol or drugs? No, we did not. And did you see any significant number of instances in which uh, you saw thrill-seeking behavior or reckless behavior on the part of uh, table saw users? There are other products where we've seen that, as our colleague Commissioner Mohorovic has yes. reminded us. But on um, these, I'm, with there's these, there's probably multiple definitions of, of reckless. But in general, most of most of these incidents, um, I, are we don't have many details on them from the NICE, of course. But it, it, that my overall impression of them, as I've read through thousands and thousands of cases, is that almost all of them are typical. What you would expect of a typical use of a table saw. Um, and again, with respect to the obviousness of a hazard, the staff does say that uh, you got a rotating blade saw. It's pretty obvious that it can cut you. But that doesn't really answer the question about the obviousness of the hazard and one that consumers actually can recognize. And I want to quote from the briefing package. Even consumers who are fully aware of the hazards and how to avoid them may suffer from slips or lapses that could lead to blade contact and injury despite the consumer's best intentions to use a product safely. Uh, and you say human error is inevitable even among exper expert woodworkers. So do we see that uh, even expert woodworkers are suffering injuries? The experience level of the woodworker is not in the NICE data, so that would be something from our mm -hmm. reported data, and I, I don't believe we have that level of detail. Um, Back to the adequacy of the voluntary standard, and you've pointed out that uh, U-Health has tried, oh, how they've tried to get AIM technology incorporated into a voluntary standard. Uh, and all times, the industry has strongly rejected this technology. Do you see any likelihood of AIM technology being adopted on a voluntary standard in the near, or frankly, the far future? Not based on the past two votes, but we can always hope. Um, just out of this is a side question. Uh, you said there are alternatives to detecting human contact with the saw, such as electrical, thermal, visual, electromagnetic, and ultrasound. Boy, that sounds uh, very uh, technical and perhaps geeky. Uh, is anybody, to your knowledge, looking at these technologies just out of curiosity? Those technologies are used for sensing in other product types, but we're not aware of a product using those for table saws. Uh, and I was curious because AIM technology is being talked about on uh, table saws, but could this be used on other products that cut and slice, radial saws, uh, band saws, chain saws, hedge trimmers, it, lawn it, it could be, but we're not aware of any that are uh, okay. available. Um, the staff estimates, estimates that the number of table saws sold annually could decrease by about 90,000 to 250,000 units annually. Uh, could you again explain how you came up with those estimates? Uh, I mean, basically, we figured, uh, figured out what the increase in the price of the saws would be. Uh, we used a con the concept of elasticity, which is a technical term that means the percentage change in quantity given a percentage change in price. Uh, and from a, a, a source, uh, we uh, used a, uh, an elasticity estimate of, uh, for, for home, uh, home products of some sort that included power saws, among other things. Uh, and so we, I mean, so simply, we multiplied the uh, uh, percentage change in price times the elasticity that gives us that gives us then the percentage change in quantity that would be demanded uh, and that's I mean I think that answers your question maybe that isn't no uh, it does answer my question and uh, I've got a longer question which I'll have to withhold on thank you very much thank you Commissioner Adler Commissioner Robinson um, Ms. Garland I have a couple quick questions for you Am I correct that when you, in my understanding from your answer you gave me yesterday, because I asked you how we excluded work-related injuries, 
Why don't you just tell us? So for, from the NICE or CPSRMS, uh, from the NICE? So from, uh, so NICE, um, for, for the part that CPSC staff uses, it's by definition non-occupational injuries. There's, um, if an occupational injury came, came through and was coded in NICE, it would in turn receive a weight of zero and be excluded. That, so we have, so there, they are, the, what's representative is supposed to be only non-occupational injuries. There is a okay. small proportion of unknowns there, um, right. and for table saws, it's about as 6%. As in everything in life, but, that, yeah. but what we exclude them as a general rule. I, yes. Okay. Um, the other question, I just want to make sure I understand. Of the two surveys, the 821 number and the 275, those universes, you pulled the NICE reports enough to have information about, uh, some information at a minimum, about severity of the injuries, right? Whether it's amputation. Right. We have diagnosis and body part. Excellent. Okay. Um, so it's back to you, Dr. Reck, because you answered the question um, I was asking about the 2007-2008 um, survey, and you said that you were going back and looking at it. Can you just tell me what, what you're doing? Uh, well, staff analyzed that uh, previously in 2014. I think right. we published a note about right. not using it and why. And in that, it included an evaluation of what we could and couldn't glean from that in terms of looking at it different ways, looking at the, the, what the consumers said about the drive, what the consumers said about the uh, saw type, what they said about the make and model. Right. I looked at and, that report. And, you know, so we're, we're looking at that again to see, uh, you know, it, it, it seems to indicate that it's not usable uh, Really, to get at any of that, um, but we're, we're, you know, we we just talked to you yesterday about it. We're we're looking right. back at that. Right. And, and, and so well. what I hadn't thought of yesterday is the uh, because because that when I spoke with you, it, because I didn't realize that in, uh, in an awful lot of cases, if you just know the manufacturer, you know the saw type. I didn't know that until yesterday. So I I guess my question is specifically, I understand the report we put out in 2014. And I understand why we said we couldn't rely on it, and I understand that it's because of the subjectivity that that became part of that survey. But again, I'm going back to my question: if, if we can find objective evidence of saw type in any of these cases, or is that something that we're looking at? Ms. Garland's coming up, Hi. so maybe <laughs> she's the one doing it. So the 2014, um, so the 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 report that's being referenced here. So that was part of the analysis. Um, when we did the staff re reclassification, the subject matter experts looked through each one, considered anyone that had uh, manufacturer um, model information, horsepower, um, all of that. And yes, it went, so when we were doing that, we also accounted for um, whether a, a manufacturer only made um, a certain type of saw. So that's reflected in that 2000, those 2014 report. So, I, so what, I, what I don't know is what percentage of those were able to tell the saw type from that objective information. Do you? Have, so, so and I apologize, I don't so have the 14 um, on, report. On page in front seven, of me. sorry, that on okay. page seven um, on the staff re reclassification, that um, so basically after all was said and done, after look, considering the manufacturer and everything, that um, we said that 81.1% was a known type of saw. Okay. And did you do the same thing with respect to the 2014-2015 data to see uh, no, if we had that, ob objective that, evidence? That No. So for the... For the 2014-15 study, we ran into a different type of problem. With right, the, with I the understand. Study. It was and so. No, we did not look at it. We didn't because of the the overarching issue with that study. We did not do the same type of analysis. Okay, but do we have information? I understand the interviewer effect, and I understand the problem with that. But again, that's that's an interviewer asking questions and coming to up to coming with the judgment of what type of saw it was. Do we have objective evidence of what saw type? That that we asked what no, we did we did have questions in there that in, that included manufacturer and model and that I don't have the results in front of me so I do not okay. know what the But the is thought. that something we could take a look at to see if we have objective evidence from that survey? Um, I think that you want I did uh, okay. I'm trying to come just up with any sure answer in the world okay. so that we can get type of saw because it's just such critically important information. So for the 2014-15 study, the staff's recommendation is, still stands that we just don't rely on that data. 
I understand that. That's not my question. My question is whether we have objective evidence of model number or manufacturer that we could use to make any sort of conclusion that is, has a foundation from objective evidence, not from the interview about type of saw. From the NICE record? No, of course so that not would be from the, the only, NICE so record. For, for, no. From my perspective, sorry. That <laughs> now, I understand you're excluding that. I'm asking you just for a moment put on another hat of problem solver because I'm trying to figure out if there's any way to resolve this. In the 2014-2015, 275 cases, do we know, have we looked at whether we have any objective evidence of saw type in any of those cases? It's going to be the same as the 2007 studies. There are going to be some that have the manufacturer information, some that don't. So we'd have to go back to look at that to answer your question. Okay. Obviously, for 2007, 2008, we've already done that. Um, but, I, but I'm just asking if we can do that about the 14, right. 15. Uh, it was a question that was asked but was not always answered. Sorry? It was a question that was asked. It I understand wasn't that, answered, but, so we'll but that's not my question. My question is we've obviously gone back and looked for objective evidence in the 2007, 2008 data. I'm asking if we could go and do that same thing with respect to the 14, 15. We'll have to get back to you on whether or not that's possible. We'll take, we'll, we'll, we're, we're looking at, at the data and we'll. Okay, we'll but the possible I'm asking, I'm obviously not asking my question well, very but well. Part of, the, part of the question is whether or not we can rely on even what the answer was. So is it objective information or not that we have and how much of that do we have and is it enough of it to count? So okay. I, let, I can't let, answer that. Let right me now. ask it a different way. Could we go back and look at those 275 cases and see have, if we have manufacturer or model number for the saws or pictures? Yes, we can physically go okay. back and look at this. Um, with the 2017 uh, in-depth investigation that you're doing, um, I, Ms. Stralka, you have explained about what you're doing with respect to saw type. Are there, is there, are there other data that we're trying to get from that 2017 more thorough analysis with the field investigators coming out other than, than definitive proof of saw type for purposes of this package? Yes, we're trying to collect also through the IDI um, information about the hazard scenario, about the injury, and about what safety mechanisms were in use at the time. Okay, so we're getting injury. information with respect to whether it, it meets the voluntary standard, in other words, whether it has a mo modular blade guard and whether it was being used. That's our objective, yes. Okay. And is that information that, I guess I'll ask the group because somebody can answer, is that information that we think is important in terms of our analysis of how well the voluntary standard's working? Because we essentially, as I understand it, we only have one person who's told us that they had the guard in place um, and still suffered an injury. Well, we think it's useful information and that it will help inform if, if the commission directs us to go forward to a final rule, that it'll help us inform us with that information, that it's important information. Okay. Um, can, can you tell me, uh, sorry, Ms. Strelka, I'm not done yet. Can you tell me why it is, and maybe it was not you who chose this, but why it is you chose a 12-month period? And what I'm getting at with this, so you can answer whichever of these questions you want, is whether we could get enough information that econ would be comfortable relying on for purposes of looking at types of saws involved, involved in injuries and the severity of those injuries in order to do a better cost-benefit analysis than, than the break-even. Um, I'm just wondering if we could use a smaller sample size in terms of, are we looking at 12 months because of numbers we need or because it's neat or I'm sure there's an epidemiological reason. Yes, there it. is indeed. Um, to have enough responses, basically IDIs that um, can project nationally. 
we know the distribution of table saw types differ. Some of them are less, obviously. And so in order to be able to pick up enough incidents to project that nationally, we think, yes, a year um, is designed in to hopefully project. Yeah. Okay. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have no more questions at this time, but I understand Commissioner Mohorovic could use some extra time, so I'm going to yield to him. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. I appreciate that very much. And uh, uh, Dr. Rogers, if you wouldn't mind joining us, because I know he's back. Uh, because I, I spent my first round of questioning getting into that difference in the ANPR and the NPR, specifically the increase in benefits of $1.7 uh, billion. And you did a fantastic job of providing that to me. And I wanted to take a little bit of time here to summarize that. Uh, you started uh, with, the, with the first uh, explanation for that difference between the ANPR and NPR as an increase in health costs, which amounted to $790 million of that $1.7 billion. Right. The price, the price level increase plus changes in the injury, injury cost, cost model. And I went back and looked at that period and determined a compound aggregate growth rate and with health care in the news every day, uh, about a 5 percent. Um, compounded um, growth rate for costs seemed to make sense and, and for me at least, back of the napkin certainly legitimized that amount. And then you also mentioned that that 1.7 is made up a 480 million increase in the increase in amputations that you saw from ANPR to NPR. Now, I'll still leave it out there as a criticism. I don't know how we lead on page one with there's no discernible change in the type of injuries related to table saw. I would think that would be clearly amputations, but you don't have to comment on that. The last part we didn't, time didn't allow for you to have the opportunity to describe is the final contributor to that $1.7 billion increase was the increase in the hospitalization rate and how that's such a big driver. I wanted to give you the opportunity in a minute or so to describe that and uh, why we're seeing such an increase between the formulation of the ANPR and the NPR in hospitalization rates. I think we would understand how that's a big driver of cost, but maybe if you can get to why we're seeing uh, increased hospitalization okay. rates. Okay. Uh, to what we were talking about earlier today. Yes, sir. Uh, there are two reasons why, well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the proportion of hospitalizations increased from about 4.1% in the ANPR to about 9.2% uh, in the uh, NPR. And I'm talking about the injury cost estimate, the injury at cost model estimate. It's not necessarily nice. Uh, but that's made up of two components. One, there was an increase in the nice estimates of amputate, uh, hospitalizations. And on top of that, uh, since the uh, ANPR, one of our contract task orders uh, uh, was used to better estimate uh, the proportion of uh, uh, direct hospitalizations as opposed to going through NICE first. I mean, we have most of most of the hospitalizations you go into the emergency room and you get it, and then you go into uh, the hospital at that point when the doctors send you there but in 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 some cases and it's not as many but in some cases uh, you might be directly admitted say you see a physician and they say you need to go into the hospital immediately uh, that in uh, so not only did the nice estimate of hospitalizations go go up, but our contract work showed us that in the uh, 2011 analysis, we were probably using too small of, of a direct proportion of hospitalizations. So it was a combination of those two factors. Excellent. Thank you. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to wrap that up because I found it, um, uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time together on it as soon as just a couple hours ago, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to mention that third important factor, and thank you very much uh, for explaining that for those playing along at home. Um, I wanted to get to a different subject. I want to talk about the comments. So the comments were identified in the, uh, the overview briefing. Uh, I recognize that we had 1,600 comments on this rule. Um, the also, the briefing package was, very, was forthright in indica indicating that 1,466 of those comments were against the rule, 
while only 134 were in support of the rule. So to me, I'll use the word overwhelming, that to me is an overwhelming amount of 92% of the public being against this rule, and, and this to me is a point about self-governance, it's a point about political legitimacy, it's a point about the Constitution beginning with the words, we the people, of which we're sworn to uphold, and also the fact that for those of us, all of us serving uh, the public, should listen closely to those who are privileged to serve. At what point in time, with the sample size of 1,600 comments, would staff ever relinquish and just say, look, we're, in the end, we're serving the people, and the people just don't want this. As much as we think it's helpful, as much as we wish there was AIM technology on everything, is there, uh, is there a percentage? Does that ever cross the mind of the team? And this is a question for you, uh, Ms. Paul. At what point in time do you, would you ever step back and say, this is so overwhelmingly rejected by the American public, we ought to rethink this and pause before so going forward with rulemaking. And I ask you as the project leader and, and as one who might be able to capture some of the thoughts of the team, and was this something that was ever considered by the team too, that maybe we ought to at least pump the brakes if not uh, recommend terminating based on the overwhelming will of the people, and I don't mean nine out of 10 comments, 92% of 1,600 comments coming in. Well, as a project manager, that's, I, I can't say that's one of the thought processes I go through when I'm putting together a package. And in terms of comments to, a, you know, a federal register notice, I'm looking for substantial comments. And so I look past the opinions and the, all the comments that are being made that aren't necessarily substantial. And I'm, I'm specifically looking for what do we need to respond to. So. Are the comments just looked at barriers and obstacles to overcome as opposed to informing our government on what our government should be, uh, should be uh, directing towards? I see them towards? as really valuable sources of information to inform us. I don't see them as barriers. So is there any indication of at what percent of, of a large sample that staff might consider withdrawing from a rule? if it's not 92 percent. We'll go through another round of comments <laughs> and some and the public might want to hit a certain number if there's if there's one out there. I, I don't believe that's part I of I think our Dr. Reck wants to jump yeah. in. I just wanted to say I mean we, we, had, we did help. address the, you know all of the comments in, in not individually but in in groups uh, within the package so uh, you know we certainly were were informed by the comments and we're seeking uh, additional comments uh, with this package if the Commission uh, moves forward. Uh, but it, it's the substance of the comments that we're interested in, not the quantity, and we certainly welcome them all. Okay. I just say that as one who has also uh, put forward and worked with my colleagues to support a, um, uh, an interpretive regulation and had, having overwhelming uh, uh, feedback from the public. Uh, negative to that, I went scurrying back to the corner with my tail between my legs and figured it's time to reset as opposed to pushing forward, uh, relating, of course, to firewalk, fireworks. Um, I want to talk about unintended consequences. I mean, I noticed that we had a recall associated with a table saw uh, recently where the metal foldable, foldable stand was collapsing. There was nine injuries, including fractures, lacerations, and amputations. And, uh, I think these are the kind of hazards and performance measures that are addressed in the voluntary standard. Also, uh, in the epidemiology memo in Appendix B, the staff acknowledges the use of, quote, homemade table saws, end quote, and that staff expressly removed the incidents where there was an indication that the product was a homemade table saw, not unlike what was described when we knew definitively that an incident was a result of uh, an occupational injury. Uh, if, in fact, we double the price point, for a benchtop table saw at retail, how many consumers do we expect to push into the DIY homemade table saw uh, option? We, we don't know the answer to that, but uh, uh, that was, as uh, Greg mentioned, part of the reasoning behind less than 100% effectiveness. Mm -hmm. No, and I appreciate that it's difficult to ascertain, but as much as we did an excellent job in understanding a loss of consumer surplus, perhaps by the elasticity and a, um, 
uh, decision points for consumers to know longer. Is that kind of a risk-risk analysis something that we can come up with to understand then commensurately if we push the opening price point of a saw to a certain point that folks will, and I've Googled it myself, I won't do it with the phone, convert my circular saw to a table saw, and you'll lead, immediately see an eight-point list that comes up into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, how you can make your own table saw, table saw out of a circular saw. And I'm concerned if we push that price point up, and I think that's the kind of risk-risk analysis um, that should be considered. Is that something that, um, and I do recognize also we're soliciting comments on that. Um, is that something that we're considering here? Uh, well, uh, I mentioned earlier that part of the reason we think that uh, the effectiveness would be less than 100% is because people might use substitutes, and those substitutes might have the risks, have additional risks. Uh, but okay. we, we can't really quantify uh, what you're talking about. I mean, it's likely to happen, I, I suspect, but we don't know how frequently it would happen. I mean, if, I mean, with our highest cost estimates, we reduced bench saw sales by a substantial amount. I don't remember exactly what it was. But I would imagine some of those people would, would use substitutes. Uh, or actually, one thing they might, a common response would be to keep an older table saw longer. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't get rid of it. Uh, but if they didn't have a table saw and they couldn't afford a new one, then they might use some substitute, like a hand saw as opposed to a table saw. Thank you. Madam Chairman, I notice I've gone over the expended time that... I believe that Chairman, or excuse me, that Commissioner Kay yielded his 10 minutes to you. Did you take 20 minutes? I don't think you did. Not yet, but I promise to respect that extra minute and a half I've gone over in my 10 minutes, if that's okay with, with you, Madam Chairman. Okay, resetting I the clock. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. I, I didn't realize that that was part of what the consideration is in the 90% effectiveness, the alternatives which might include homemade table saws. So thank you for that uh, answer. I didn't pick that up in the package. The last um, question that I have had to do with the small business impact uh, that was projected. And I'm, and I'm curious why there wasn't an analysis of uh, the impact that this proposed rule might have specifically on the construction industry. And I realize that we've taken out the workplace-related incidents, but I think we all know that contractors buy these saws. I mean, after all, one of the defined categories are contractor saws, are they not? So in the original, in the initial Reg Flex analysis from page one, um, defining the, the general purpose of the Reg Flex analysis as, quote, a description of and where feasible, an estimate of the number of small entities to which the proposed rule will apply. And there's no estimate or indication of the impact to the construction industry, specifically the small construction industry. I, I appreciate the work that was done to evaluate the impact on small manufacturers of table saws, uh, but why not consider the impact, uh, I would think the relative impact on the construction industry for significantly raising the increase in the price of these saws uh, would dwarf the impact on small manufacturers of the saws themselves. Susan, um, yeah, the direct impact of the rule will be on the manufacturers and not. The, also in the construction industry, it is an indirect impact. However, if you look at the cost of the saw, even if they have to buy, you know, a saw a year, that is going to be a fairly small percent of their total revenue. There, it's raising the price of the saw they buy, but chances are that saw itself is going to be, they're going to have a lot more revenue. We generally consider something a significant impact or potentially significant if it's more than 1%. Mm. So if a table saw goes up a price by, to use a higher estimates, you know, $1,000, to be 1%, the construction company's revenue would have to be um, more than a hundred, less than a hundred thousand a year. Okay. And that's assuming they're buying a new table saw each year. Okay, understood. So um, that's, that is... But let me ask you this. Okay. If we were considering what is a significant rule, that's a rule with an impact of how much? A uh, hundred million. I believe that's greater than a hundred million. A hundred million. And our costs identify here are how much? Over a billion? Uh, 
there are uh, more than 100 million. So if a significant rule is one that has a cost impact of $100 million or more, and we're identifying costs here of over a billion dollars, do we not expect that there at least be $100 million in costs that are born, in the con born to the construction industry, which would trigger a whole level of reporting requirements in the federal government so that everybody is well aware of the small business uh, impact of what would, in and of itself, it was if it was only applying to the construction industry, would be a significant or a major rule as defined in, I think, uh, EO 12866. Yeah, is that under the Congressional Review? I mean, I, I was looking at the Regulatory Flexibility Act, which is significant right. to likely be significant, a substantial number of small businesses. Mm -hmm. I think this other thing you're talking about is like the Congressional Review Act, where you're looking at the um, Major rule being more than 100 True, million. True, but I'm just and wondering why we didn't look at the impact of the to the construction industry. If the total costs of the rule are, um, and is it what is it over one billion? It's uh, off the top of your thanks, Dr. Direct. <laughs> I honestly don't know. Yeah, one. Costs were about 170 to 350 million per year. Right. Okay. And all right, that's okay. So that's not the billion dollar number I was just citing. So uh, 100 to 170. Okay. Um, well, I hope that's taken into consideration. Um, it, to me, it seems that the, the, the small businesses, and the, especially in the construction industry, would be uh, disproportionately impacted by the rule. And uh, I hope we might be able to do some analysis uh, just to know for sure what that impact would be uh, on them. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. That concludes my questions, Madam Chairman. Thank you. I want to give the staff the opportunity. We will have one more round of questions, but if uh, staff would like to take a break for 10 minutes, we can do that and then just rece uh, we'll recess for 10 minutes and then, or if you just want to slog through this. Keep going? Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I want to just uh, piggyback briefly on one of uh, Commissioner Mohorovic's um, uh, questions of you. There are saws out in the marketplace right now with the Ames technology, is that correct? Yes. And so consumers can choose to buy them or to not buy them, correct? Correct. And so some may not buy one because they're expensive because they don't think that additional expense is worth it and so they don't buy it. That is correct. So my concern is, is similar to Commissioner Mohorovic's in that are we imposing our will rather than letting the market work. Uh, the technology is available, the saws are available, and if the, chooser, if the consumer chooses to buy a saw or not, that really is something that we, um, you know, we probably shouldn't interfere with. And I, that's really more of a statement than a question. I, I do want to get back to some of the data um, issues that we've all raised here today because I'm thinking primarily of a recent court decision uh, that called into question the reliability of our data. So I think that that's um, a lesson learned that we all need to be cognizant of as we go forward as an agency. I don't think we want to find ourselves in that situation. So I went through um, the package and I want to make sure I understand the, the studies and, and our sources of data because, and I, and I hope you'll add to this and, and help me understand that in addition to this, what we're doing in the 17, with the 17 data is going to provide us the robust data we need. So the first thing I have was we reviewed all the incident data estimates from NICE uh, for table bench saws in 2015, right? But we've, we've agreed that NICE is pretty broad information. It's, it can't tell us the degree of the severity of the laceration. And so we, we know that there was contact with the blade, but we don't know much more beyond that. Is that accurate? We also know uh, uh, some of the severity in Fraser. We know if there was a, a fracture or an amputation, you know, so there's different levels of severity. You you know, we, right. So we have those different uh, uh, outcomes or uh, what do you call it? Uh, Diagnosis. Diagnoses. Thank you. My concern is that it, uh, is per your table that the lacerations do account for the majority of the injuries. Um, but so, so beyond that, then we did a, a, we compared the distribution of table saw injury characteristics against all other workshop products for related injuries uh, for 2015. Is that information incorporated and used in this, in the uh, NPR? 
You mean in terms of costs or? In terms of the data, making, giving us confidence that the data that we're proceeding with in justifying this rulemaking. It is, it's in the NPR, yes. I mean, that, that, that information is, is in the briefing package and it's, it provides some context to the injury patterns. Okay. And then we um, talked about the CPSRM information, but that's anecdotal. That isn't, I think that in, during the uh, briefing, the reports that were submitted through that, that was anecdotal. That's really non-statistical. Correct. And then we talked about the two sp nice special studies that we had difficulties with. And so they're not, they're not, we can't use those, the, the questions and, and all that followed from that are too subjective. Now we're going to take this different path. We talked about the modular blade guard survey. That's not statistical. So my concern as an agency is the data that we're relying on. I mean, I think we all agree that there are some gaps here and some voids. How are we going to, if it's possible, between now and an NPR and a final rule, remedy that situation so that our data is robust and there is, the package could provide justification for rulemaking? We think the package provides justification for an NPR uh, currently as, as it stands. Uh, that's why I recommended it. Uh, we are seeking the additional information in the 2017 study that we've discussed, and we think that will help inform us moving forward. Okay. I, 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 well, I'll just leave it at that because I am concerned, um, and that's not a secret to anyone. I am concerned about the integrity of the data. I want to talk a little bit. Um, I had meetings, and I think many of my colleagues did, with PTI, the Power Tool in Industry, and they shared some injury statistics with us on the new modular guard versus the older traditional guards. And um, the, the increasing trend in safety with regards to the most recent uh, UL, the seventh edition of the UL standard. Has, has our staff considered the uh, data that PTI has provided? And have we considered that in this and in our analysis of this rulemaking? So um, I don't have the, the actual data. I have the summary that was provided by PTI. And um, so the, uh, I had um, several questions concerning the, the methodology and what's actually being compared here and the fact that it's on anecdotal reporting, um, something similar to our CPS RMS, which um, as a statistician I would um, would say that the same thing I said in the, in the package, that's for the CPS RMS, that um, conducting trend analysis on the anecdotal data um, isn't valid at, at for, for uh, isn't valid due to the being anecdotal and to rely on the NICE for any trend analysis and statistical changes. Have we met with the industry, the PTI? Have we met with them? Have we had a tech-to-tech -tech meeting? Have we kind of followed the ROV model where we actually engaged and shared data and information um, so that we're understanding each other's approach to this? We have through working groups with, uh, through UL. Uh, PTI has, has uh, participated in those working groups. But we haven't done it with a, a tech to tech meeting such as we did early on with, well, well both window coverings as well as um, ROVs. We, we have met with PTI in the past, but we have not, um, Recently, I believe they asked for a meeting, but we haven't finalized that meeting. Okay, I, I would be interested in, and we can talk further about this. The the uh, how we reconcile the data they provided to us and our data, and to just make sure we're, like you say, uh, Ms. Garland, that we're looking at the same information, that it's not anecdotal, and and to see where they're coming from with that information. Um, <coughs> I, um, I want to talk just briefly, and my time is running out here, uh, with regards to the technology that's being used in, in what we've been talking about. So the briefing package suggests, and we've talked about, and Dr. Reck, you did a, a fine job of going through the technology that's being used here, and that's the electromagnetic. Um, but there's alternative technologies. Have we looked at, do we understand what's out there? Have we checked to see if there's patents, if this is being, um, right now, if there's, you know, patents out there and if this, um, 
this is being looked at as potential? Well, I, I mean, so we're not aware of any products on the market using these other technologies for uh, table saws. I mean, there's certainly the sensing technologies of a variety are used in other products. My car does all kinds of sensing and, and other things do too. Uh, but how it would apply to a table saw, I, I, you know, in terms of patents, I, I, I don't know. Um, so we talked <coughs> earlier about saw stop and their patents, and it's very possible that their, some of their patents cover some of these detection methods. Um, just in a review of the patents they submitted to the IC, ITC, um, one of their patents did talk about variations and modifications to various sensing systems, including um, motion detector, electromagnetic field sensor, and optical sensors. However, as I mentioned before, that was not one of the patents that the ITC found had been infringed upon. So um, it is very possible that their patented technology is not just by SawStop, by, but by other manufacturers out there in existing patents. We just don't know how they would be viewed if there was a patent litigation in a review in court or by the ITC. So it is possible. Thank you. Um, I, want, I wanted to just ask uh, Ms. Garland to come back up just for a second. I have one other question and my time is running out. With regards to the, um, the data, and you mentioned PTI's data may be too anecdotal to use. We've acknowledged some of ours is anecdotal. How about saw stops data to the agency? Have, have we used that in this package and have we relied on that in any way? I, I have not reviewed that data myself. Okay, has anyone in the agency, has that been incorporated into, into the uh, briefing, into the NPR? It was submitted as comments, but we didn't use it in any of our economic analysis or epidemiologists. Good, thank you very much. Commissioner Adler. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, and it's always a delight to be up on the same table with uh, Commissioner Mohorovic because uh, he raises incredibly important and interesting uh, policy questions. So I guess one question I would have going back to the number of comments that were filed that were negative with respect to the ANPR. When we published that, did we say, this is a plebiscite, will you please tell us uh, how you want the commission to act? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess that I do have a, a, a more serious question and that is uh, typically when we publish an NPR, do we not tend to get uh, responses from the people in the uh, business community, the manufacturing community who would be directly affected by that? Uh, and do we not typically have more of them saying we don't like this than those saying we like it? I, I take that head shake as a, an affirmative. Um, I thought I didn't have to answer that. No, either, you did okay. well. <laughs> um, and I just make another observation that there are a number of things that, uh, that we as a society have mandated that people don't necessarily like, um, I think if we were to do a plebiscite on whether kids should be able to drive under the age of 16, we might get uh, an interesting array of responses or the ability of teenagers to drink uh, under the age of uh, 21. I think we might get uh, some skewed numbers, but that doesn't mean that we as a society necessarily uh, support that simply as a plebiscite. And uh, the one that uh, also I think is, is one of those that I think society's had the most trouble, but it's also produced one of the greatest benefits is mandatory seatbelt laws. But uh, setting that aside, I did want to um, uh, ask I, just a couple of questions. One is uh, with respect to uh, higher prices resulting from the safety standard, you make what I think is the valid point that safety standards tend to be mitigated in the longer run. Uh, and that's an important point to me because to the best of my knowledge, uh, and those of you who have sort of historical perspective, I'd like to be uh, corrected if I'm wrong, virtually every safety standard that the CPSC has promulgated and other agencies like NHTSA, they've had prices drop once the uh, industry begins producing compliant products for two reasons, economies of scale and increased expertise in production. Um, are, is anybody aware of any standard that we 
mandated where, of course, prices go up in the short run, but where the prices have increased over the long run as opposed to dropping over the long run? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rogers. You know, just, just to address your question, in the regulatory analysis, we did point out that it was possible the prices uh, would drop in the future, uh, although we didn't know how much that would, ha would occur. But we pointed out that uh, over 10 years, if we assume that uh, the prices that we used in the analysis were correct for the first five years, but then after five years, uh, prices went down, that if after five years they went down by about a third, then the 10-year average cost would be about 140 to 290 million relative to the 170 to 340 million. And if prices uh, dropped by two-thirds, that the 10-year uh, annualized average would be about 120 to 240 million a year. So, so yeah. we, we, we can't quantify what's going to happen, but, but yeah, we, it, it, it's not completely unexpected that prices might drop in the future. Well, the, the closest analogy I can think of would be lawnmowers because, uh, and this, these are rough numbers because I don't remember them well, but something on the order of a 30% price increase on some models of lawnmowers after the commission mandated a lawnmower standard. Today, you can buy a lawnmower from pretty much the same price that they were selling even with inflation that for the uh, cost that they, they required uh, when we did the mandatory standard, but the difference is they're for 50 percent fewer injuries. So uh, there is that, – that's why I say it's useful even with cost-benefit to look to the long run, not just to the short run. And so now back to my – one of my uh, major concerns, and that is uh, seniors. Uh, you said seniors suffer injuries at a greater rate than younger ones. Uh, and the estimated mean age for table saw blade contact injury victims is 55.6 years, whereas all other workshop product-related injury victims have an estimated mean age of 42.7. Any idea why there's such a discrepancy with respect to table saws as compared to other home products? Uh, no, we don't know the, the reason for that. Uh, if it's usage patterns or other factors, we don't, we don't know. Okay. Just to add, we didn't say rate. It's just those were the numbers we had for 2015. No, those, yeah. That, I, I, did I say rate? I didn't mean to say rate. Um, and I guess the other question I would have with respect to the special study that's underway now, the 2017 study, unless I'm mistaken, we are hoping to get a statistical, statistically representative picture from that study. Yes, it is, it is tied to the NICE uh, data, so if we get, if, if they, it's intended to provide something that can be extended to national estimates. And I guess just a final comment, uh, I appreciate uh, Chairman Burkle's uh, raising the issue of tech-to-tech -tech, uh, meetings with the industry. Where I find there is a huge difference between this situation and the ROV is in this situation we've just had this technology voted down decisively twice in recent years by the industry. I think there's uh, precious little hope that the industry is going to show much interest in AIM technology. So uh, at least to me that's a significant difference. Thank you. I have no further questions. Sorry. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Dr. Recht, you said that what we have in this package, in your opinion, is enough for an NPR. I think um, Chairman Burkle has raised what is really the elephant in the room for everyone um, in terms of the recent court decision, which makes all of us very, very careful, more careful than ever. Although I think in my four years in the, on, uh, on the commission, we've been, we've been very careful, but more than ever, that we make sure that our bases for a mandatory rule are really strong. And throughout this package, uh, I think each of the directorates has made um, comments about the paucity of the data and the problems with the, the um, speculation um, that has had to be used because of not knowing, and the most essential piece, as we all know, is we don't know what types of saws are involved in blade-related um, injuries. 
And while I understand from the 2017 data, we hope to get some more information about the use of a mo the modular guards on, on saws that meet the standard, I think you saying that would be useful is about as strong as certainly in my opinion at this point that information would be. But I think the type of saws involved in these injuries is absolutely essential. So I, I, um, I guess um, one of the things I would like someone on the team to address is with respect to this, tw I, I think at the moment, and let me make sure this is true, that the only plan for enhancing our data to make it stronger between now and when we might consider a final rule is this 2017 survey. Is that right? Uh, we also invite comments on a variety right. of matters. But in terms of what we're going to do internally so that we have statistical data that we can rely upon to do cost-benefit analyses, we don't get that in comments typically. Uh, we get that internally, right? Well, uh, I think we do ask some questions that uh, relate to that. And then depending on what comments we receive, we may seek to do additional work. I mean, that happens with other rulemakings that we do. Okay. So in terms of what we're going to do internally, it's that 2017 survey. Is that right? At this point? Is that our plan? At this point, yes. Okay. And what, can you tell me what aspects you as a team think we're going to be addressing in the final rule that you expect to get from this 2017 um, survey that would be essential? I think it, it will help to address the cost-benefit analysis. Um, it, 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 we're looking to get information on usage patterns, on uh, blade guard use, right, some of the things that help inform your decisions. Um, the most essential information, I take it, is the type of saw that's involved in blade-related injuries. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, I know we've tried this. Um, this has now been been about a 10-year effort in trying to do this. We've had two surveys. We both know that both of them had to be, the results had to be discarded. So can somebody tell me what we're going to be doing in terms of checking? Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in how we came up with the methodology to make sure this time we get it right and also what we're going to be doing in the process of the next now nine months um, to make sure that at the end of this time we actually have data that we can rely upon. We found in both of these special studies that it was difficult for the participants to distinguish their saw if it was a table saw from a contractor saw and contractor saw saying, oh, well, I'm a contractor, that's my saw. And we found it difficult to do through the telephone. So to remove that uncertainty, we collaborated with compliance and its field staff to be able to go out and get pictures to actually have evidence that the subject matter experts here can look at. And we also built into that our protocol for the field to tell them and train them as to what type of table saw was there. Okay. Um, I know we only talked about this a couple of days ago, and I didn't have the sense that anyone had really thought about it, but we do have a 12 months of data from 20, uh, 2016 of NICE data that we talked about we could plug in 0841 and we could get we could start the process of getting that data so that we could contact people and if the essential piece of information that we're missing um, which I for everything in the package this is certainly the conclusion I come to is the essential pieces we're missing the type of saw involved in the the blade related injuries if we took that one year um, and we contacted people, and I'm sure in these great brains in this room, we can come up with some creative, really simple ways in which the, we could be absolutely certain of what kind of saw was used. 
whether it's, and we don't need a field investigator to go out and take a picture, it's 2017. Probably everyone in this room has texted a picture in the last week. I mean, we could have them text them to us. I mean, what, there are so many creative ways that we could get a picture of the saw that's involved in the incidents for 2016. And I only say that um, because of this question. Is somebody considering this as a way that we could more quickly get this absolutely essential data? The statisticians have indeed considered that option. Okay. And are they considering it or have they considered and rejected it? We have considered it and based on sample sizes, selection bias, that it's requiring somebody to take the picture and send it in, and other aspects, we strongly recommend that we cannot statistically defend that approach. So if we were able to come up with contact information for every blade-related saw injury for the year of 2016, and we contacted those people, and we had what I think, I think you told me there were a thousand in the 18 months, um, and we got 275 of those to respond to us. And if we had roughly the same sample size, it may, maybe it's 12 months instead of 18 months, but if we got two or 300 of those people to respond and say that they, and I'm not saying text to picture is the only answer. It just is a one creative approach of if we could get a picture of the saw involved in each of those injuries, that's not information you think we could rely on? I can't answer that question. I don't have the information um, historically from us ever doing that. And there is bias induced in the way a particular survey is administered. And what is the bias that you think would be introduced by us contacting people and asking, and I'm, as I say, I'm not saying that's the only means, but asking people if we could get a picture of the saw that was involved in their injury. What's the bias that's introduced? We cannot quantify that bias. It's a self-selecting bias that the individuals don't have the means to do that. Plus, it's also um, involved in, can we even do that in our Paperwork Reduction Act? It's a different type of response that we're soliciting. What if we sent our field engineers to the house and took a picture and do it the old-fashioned way and mail it back by mail of the saws involved in the 2016 incident? I think that's, that, that's a different approach, but the thing is that would just give you um, 16 and 17 as to saw type and just 17 with the particular specifics I, I, I wasn't regarding suggesting injuring. including 17 and I wasn't suggesting stopping your work on the 17 survey. I'm talking about 2016 getting the saw type matched up with the type of injury so that we could do a cost benefit and analysis. And as we discussed on Tuesday, that is basically going to be available one to two months before the 17 is completed. So to get pictures of the saws involved in the 2016 incidents, you're telling me would take as much time as it's going to take us to do all of these thorough in-person surveys for the next year and, and, and use the information to do the analyses? Is that I'm telling, telling you that there are other issues that um, need to be addressed in order to implement what you're suggesting, and that will take time. I'm out of time. I do have further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Kay? Uh, no question. I'll yield back. Commissioner Mohorovic? Questions. I do, yeah. Just a few. I have uh, one or two additional questions, and Commissioner Robinson does, and we'll see if anyone else does and then we'll um, wrap up. So if you'll bear with us. Um, I wanted to uh, go back to something that uh, Commissioner Adler raised with uh, Dr. Rogers and that is generally when we promulgate a rule or in the case of lawnmowers and some others, the price goes down. 
but I'd like your comment. This is a unique situation. We don't have the market at work here. We only have one technology available. And so we're not sure the situation, my understanding is, I thought it, was, it was alluded to in our briefing that there may be some agreement that he will license the technology and that you know he would only get an 8% royalty. But if one person is controlling the market, wouldn't that affect the cost of products and whether or not how quickly they would come down, whether they would come down at all? I'm, I'm talking about the price of the product. Yeah, well, I mean, in our analysis, we assumed a royalty of about 8% because that's what Dr. Gass has said, has said uh, uh, he would want uh, uh, to license his technology. And of course, that's what he says, and we don't know exactly what will happen at, at that point because there's no legal, he's not bound to that. But if a <clears throat> royalty fee of, of 8% were, were required, it, w in the analysis we indicated that we thought, for example, that the, that would add about, uh, I think, 37 to $57 to the price of a bench saw. Uh, and that's based on, <clears throat> Based on the eight percent uh, royalty would be based on the uh, uh, wholesale value of a saw, and so what we did was we calculated basically the average current average price of a saw, what the additional cost would be to use the AIM technology, and then we uh, figured out what the wholesale price would be from that number, and. Uh, that's what turned out to be about $37 to $57 per bench saw, and it was higher for the more expensive saws. Uh, but yeah, that would, that would factor into the prices that people have to pay. And, and if you, uh, yesterday, Dr. Gass talked about uh, his $400 saw. I mean, he, actually, I'm not sure, should I be mentioning this? Oh, <laughs> I, never mind. I, I, I went down a bad path there. Out of the barn. Uh, but, <laughs> But even for the lower lower uh, priced saws, once they have to pay the royalty, then that will be that will be a factor that'll be uh, uh, that they'll have to take into account when they price their product. It's a peculiar situation we find ourselves in because we have a situation where we don't have an agreement or anything in writing from Dr. Gass as to whether or not he would license his product. We don't and his technology. We whether or not it would be eight percent. We've got a situation where ITC has said to Bosch, you cannot use the technology, that's a patent infringement. We have no clue as to how many patents are out there by whomever, and specifically by, with Dr. Gass, how that would affect the market. So there just seems to be a lot of probability, a lot of speculation, and when it comes to rulemaking, I, I just say that concerns me greatly. That's all I have, and I will ask Commissioner Adler. I, I'm imagining now he has a question. <laughs> uh, no, actually, just a, a quick comment, because I think the concern you raise is a very serious one. And I'll simply point out that when he filed his petition 14 years ago, he said uh, he would charge an 8% uh, uh, licensing fee uh, wholesale, and he's never changed that, and he has, uh, he has stayed with that number uh, through the years. And so even if he were to raise it a little bit from what Dr. Rogers was saying, it wouldn't really necessarily drive the cost of table saws up that dramatically. And I would also point out that the cost of a table saw and the price of a table saw isn't just dependent on the licensing fee you pay for a patent. It's also dependent on your ability to make products cheaper and your ability to achieve economies of scale, and those would kick in irrespective of the patent. And the last point I would make is patents don't last forever, uh, even Dr. Gass's, and so at some point uh, his patents will expire. So that was just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Um, another area that we have a problem in this package, in my opinion, is with respect to the information we have about how effective the voluntary standard is. We know that UL 987 became effective in 2010, and my understanding is that we believe the addition of the modular blade guard and riving knife made table saws much safer, at least according to the package. That's what was said. In order to issue a final rule in this case, we really need to know how effective UL 987 is. And as I looked at the package, um, what we're basing our comment uh, or our opinion that it is not effective on is our trend analysis, 
the 53 anecdotal cases that came in through CPS RMS, although only 11 of those involved saws with modular blades and only one of those cases do we know of that the blade guard was in place when the injury was suffered and the 2015 Eureka Facts Survey that basically says that sometimes people remove their guards. Is, have I sort of summarized the basis for our opinion on the voluntary standard? Well, we've, we've also, you know, we, what we said was that there were 30,800 30, emergency department treated blade contact injuries in 2015 and that approximately a third of the market in 2015 uh, would have been meeting the, uh, the new standard. Right, but we don't know how many of those were involved in the injuries that were incurred, right? Right, but um, just to add to what I was trying to convey in the package was that in the ANPR we did have analysis of the modular blade guard and our, our our conclusion was it was an improvement over a current technology, but it had the same weaknesses. And so our, what we predicted came true that even with the Montreal blade guard, there are still incidents occurring and the same weaknesses in terms of removing the blade guard and needing to, to make, to, for proper use of the table saw to make non-through cuts. Okay. The package notes that a more complete trend analysis would include analyses of injuries by population of table saw users, number of table saws in use, or the number of hours table saws are in use in a non-occupational setting. Obviously, we only include, uh, we only had access to the estimated number of table saws in use each year. Is, would there be any plan to get any additional information that you say would be a more complete trend analysis before a final rule? Can I just uh, uh, respond a little bit? Sure. Uh, to get that kind of information, I think we'd have to do an exposure survey. Uh, I think we talked about an exposure survey for this project a year or two ago, although I could be wrong. Uh, but that's the kind of place that we'd get information on, you know, if we did an exposure survey, we could find out how, how frequently people actually use these devices, uh, you know, when they take them off, that sort of information that, yeah. that would really be useful in an overall analysis. But I don't think we're going to have any of that sort of information okay. uh, without an exposure survey. Because when I looked at the trend analysis, I mean, given the life of saws, and I, I, you know, I only have my own anecdotal that my, I had a chainsaw for 25 years and I'd still have it if I hadn't sold the place where I used it. Um, but, uh, but people just seem to, seem, seem to keep these saws forever, and I know that we have an analysis of what the life is, but when we look at the life of saws and the fact that we're basically looking at the five years after the voluntary standard went into effect and our CPS RMS data says that 38 of the 53 cases involved had the old guards, um, I'm just wondering, first of all, is there... Is there any plan for enhancing our data on the effectiveness of the voluntary standard? And if not, do you think that we have enough data to determine whether the current voluntary standard um, is effective in reducing the risk of injury? And do you have any ideas on what additional information we might need to make this more a more solid um, basis for saying that the voluntary standard doesn't work? That would be the additional information from the 2017 study but again, to emphasize that uh, the CPR, uh, those 11 are anecdotal, but it's, it, it speaks to the fact that it's the same usage pattern and everything that we predicted in terms of the weaknesses of relying on a, any type of guard is there. Because as I understand it, basically people take them off. That's bottom Correct, line. and you can also still get cut, you know, with a guard on. Sorry? And you can also have blade contact injury with a, with a blade right. guard. But we've only got one reported on that. I'm just thinking about making sure our data is so, as solid as we can make it. I agree. Okay. Um, I, that's it. Thank you. Commissioner Kay? Commissioner Moravec? There are no more questions, and because there are no, no more questions, I will now adjourn this meeting. I want to be uh, just thank staff again, all of you, for being here and those online. Uh, for taking the time and being as patient as you were answering all of our questions. Thank you all very much. This meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission is now adjourned.